Okay, um, so I have been talking about uh, democracy and oligarchy in that ancient Greek history, and about Athens and Sparta in particular in that historical context. Now, uh, I want us to look at Athens and Sparta and their systems of self-governance uh, directly as those things uh, are presented in the eyes of contem contemporaries. So uh, we're going to read uh, a little bit about uh, about Athens from uh, uh, by, by Thucydides, a little bit about Sparta uh, written by Xenophon, and then I'll, I'll make mention of another writing by, by an uh, older author about Athens, but nobody actually knows who wrote it. Well, we'll get to that in a while. Anyway, so I want to start with Athens. Uh, and we're going to read a little bit from uh, Thucydides' history, history of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the book first before I get into what he says about Athens. Uh, it's a great book. Um, often when I teach ancient philosophy, I teach uh, substantial parts of it because it's such a uh, philosophically rich book. But I'm just going to look at it a little bit this time. But anyway, uh, Thucydides himself was born probably around 460 BC and died uh, around 400 in 400. Um, so he, his adult life is is basically the same time as the Peloponnesian War, like, but started when he was around 30, and he died right around the time that it ended. Uh, and so what's interesting about this book is that he claims, and as far as I know, historians believe him, he claims that he was writing it, he was taking account of the war while it was happening. Uh, that war that stretched over uh, 30 years. And he did that because it seemed to him when he saw it happening that this, that this should be remembered, that this was a war that wasn't just of local significance but was going to be of world historical significance, that there was a lesson, there was something to be seen and learned here for everybody. And he called his writing then, his history of the war, a katem SIA, a possession for all time. Uh, and basically, the way he writes the story is a is kind of a great tragedy. It's kind of the tragedy I think of of Athens, this great democracy that uh, ends up being kind of destroyed. Uh, and I and I think because of the way through its own actions, it, it kind of betrays its own principles and values. Um, but that larger story, that the tragedy of Athens, with the, uh, and so on. Uh, isn't uh, isn't my concern, but but I highly recommend it to anyone to read it. It's such a fantastic book. Um, but what we're going to look at is just one little part from book two, uh, and this is he's he's describing something that happened in the first year of the war, and it, the it's the occasion of a civic funeral for those who died in the war, and and this an annual annual fun annual funeral ceremony, and. Uh, on, at this funeral, uh, a prominent citizen is, you know, somebody significant is asked to give a speech. And in this case, Pericles is giving a, a, a speech at the funeral ceremony for the war dead. Uh, Pericles himself, you know, Athens doesn't have kings, it's, it's, it's democracy. Uh, but Pericles is himself a very powerful individual. Uh, he was a, a democratic reformer, but, uh, but also just a singularly powerful individual and orator in Athens, responsible for a lot of stuff and um, liked by a lot of people and hated by a lot of people. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so I wanna, I'm going to um, read a little bit and talk about uh, his, his uh, funeral oration, one of the most famous little speeches in world history. Um, so, uh, uh, and actually, as I said, this is a city funeral for the war dead. I'm going to come back uh, I think at the end and draw attention to that fact and get you to think about why that might be significant. But anyway, uh, but let's let's look. Uh, so this is page 145 of this book, section 37. So well, the first thing he says is, uh, "Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands not of a minority but of the whole people." So to you, that should sound obvious. I mean, you should see the significance of that now, given what I've been saying about the history of Greece. Nonetheless, for you as a person in the modern world, that should be very familiar. Um, but, you know, as I, I guess putting those two things together, you can see, again, you know, I've been trying to get you to strip away 2,500 years of, of uh, presumptions. That's very familiar to you and, and very obvious to you. It's a pretty different thing in the ancient world. It was, this was a, a new and amazing reality. Uh, and indeed, some of the most democratic of the democratic 
developments in Athens had really just come about partially through uh, Pericles' own actions. So this was a new and developing form of reality that nobody had ever seen before. And so it's, it's, it's pretty... Uh, powerful thing. Let me add one more thing. So yeah, in the 20th century or 21st century now, uh, you're pretty used to this democracy and you're used to that idea. And almost everybody, I think, in the modern world who reads this, maybe almost everybody, that's too strong. That's way too strong. I think most people in the modern world, educated people who read this, will take it for granted that the democracy that democracy is a good thing and they will think yeah this Athens and Pericles are standing for something that we believe is right and even when he goes on to talk about its features which we're going to discuss um, I mean I hope you will learn something from that because though you live in a democracy you may not have thought that much about what some of its features are uh, but even if you learn things the things he says should still sound sort of familiar you should say oh yeah right that's uh, that's that's what democracy is like or that's why it's important or something like that um, but so, so it should be sort of familiar, and generally, I would imagine, for most people, their, your attitude is going to be pretty positive. And I just want to mention that because you're going to see, when we look at the other writings, that that was by no means the obvious attitude among the ancient Greeks. Anyway, but so let's carry on with his um, description of the democracy. So as, as I said, the first kind of defining feature is this. Power is in the hands, not of a minority, but of the whole feature, of the the whole people. And then he goes on. When it is a question of settling private disputes, everyone is equal before the law. And there's a couple of powerful things there. First, the primacy of law, and second, the equality of everybody with respect to that. The equality of everyone under the law. So that's then, that's kind of a, an interpretation of what it means for power to be in the people. It's, it's that it's the rule of law, where law is the reflection of 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 essentially everybody's perspective and they're all equal under it. Um, and then he goes on again, he says, when it's a question of putting one person before another in positions of political responsibility, what counts is not membership of a particular class, but the actual ability that the man possesses. No one, so long as he has it in him to be of service to the state, is kept in political obscurity because of poverty. So there we have a further point, right, that the decisions about public office are not based on wealth, and they're not, their public offices are not reserved for the wealthy, but they're distributed across the people, to, including to those who are poor. Uh, and a further reminder that those offices are about service to the state. So, it, you know, the... Um, Going back to what I was saying about being a citizen last time, um, holding public office is in a way acting out of a sense that you are um, making decisions for the good of the whole. Uh, and let's read the next one. So th those are at the level of sort of official policy or sort of legal constitution, but let's read the next one. Uh, and just as our political life is free and open, so is our day-to-day -day life in our relations with each other's relations with each other. We are free and tolerant in our private lives, and in our public affairs we keep to the law. Yeah. So, so the point there is, there's an attitude, or there, there's a there are sort of rules that are built into the constitution. But this also relates to a kind of attitude, namely that this is a society that is built around a sense of openness, a sense that um, people should be allowed to to live their own way right so that's the idea of the free and open social life um, uh, yeah and then he says again at the end of that paragraph we respect the laws um, and then in the uh, next page 146 now section 38 he, he adds another thing um, he says when work is over we enjoy all kinds of recreation for our spirits so again there's an idea there that there's a certain public value put on uh, happy social activities and social life. And he carries on, there are various kinds of contests and sacrifices regularly throughout the year. And in our own homes, we find beauty and good taste. Um, and that's an issue that's going to come up again a little bit later. Um, well, maybe I'll talk about that again a little bit later. Uh, maybe I'll skip ahead to it. Well, actually, let me leave that. Um, uh, 
But so let, let's just say there that that again, just as just as a minute ago, I was when he talks about free and open social. Like if I was trying to talk about how apart from the law, there's also a sense of social openness, and here there's also a sense of the value, a, a socially held sense of the value in cultivating culture, a, uh, you know, a rich environment culture. Um, in section thirty nine, he says. Um, now, now he says something about our educational systems. He says this about so he says our city is open to the world, da 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 da. So I guess there's something there about visiting and immigration. It's another level of openness that we, we would want to consider if we were going to think about what's involved in a democracy. And then he says there's a difference too in our educational systems. And he says, and we're going to this next sentence is something we're going to go on to talk about in a moment. But so he says, the Spartans from their earliest boyhood are submitted to the most laborious training and courage. But we pass our lives without these restrictions. Um, so we're going to go talk about that Spartan education in a moment. Uh, but th the point here is the, the um, Athenians don't do that thing. As he says uh, about uh, six lines up from the bottom of page 146, near the end of 139, we do not spend our time practicing to meet sufferings that are still in the future, which is to say we don't spend our life practicing for war. Um, so that so there's something about education, um, and then section four. Yeah. So this is here we're going to connect again with that issue about culture. He says our love of what is beautiful, right? That's another cultural value, love of what is beautiful. Uh, but it doesn't lead to extravagance, and our love of things of the mind does not safe keep us make us soft. So again, this is a city that's built around the idea that we should cultivate beauty and we should cultivate our minds it's an intellectual culture and an artistic culture and that's really true and that's why as i've been saying from the beginning like greece and athens in partic particular left the world an overwhelmingly rich legacy of artistic and intellectual creation uh, this is the city that as i was saying kind of invented philosophy and history right as as disciplines and practices and it also made some of the most, uh, not just Athens, but especially Athens, made some of the most remarkable and, and um, exciting developments of art that have, again, continued to inspire people all over the world for generations, right, for, for centuries, even for millennia. Uh, so, so it's this amazing city that is really built around the distinctive idea of human flourishing. And those are some of the, some of the ways that happens. Um, uh, one more thing I wanted to read here. He says, um, right after that, he says, uh, as for poverty, no one should be ashamed to admit it. Well, so he's talking about shame, I suppose, but that should remind you of this other point that the impoverished are not excluded from civic and public life and so on. Um, He says, here, each individual is interested not only in his own affairs, but in the affairs of the state. Well, that's the big point I was trying to get at with the notion of citizenship. And he's saying here, these people live with a kind of ideal of citizenship. They, li they have a living sense of their participation in this political community. And so he says right after that, um, we do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say he has no business here at all. So that's part of the idea of the city or of the community, that it's a community that is in a way built around the value that everyone is going to take responsibility for making that community flourish. Um, and then he also says one more thing. So when, uh, he says, um, we Athenians take our decisions on policy or submit them or submit them to proper discussion for we do not think that there is an incompatibility between words and deeds well so there's another thing right the the idea of the assembly was that the people were going to get together and and, and dis debate discuss and debate about matters of public policy and then eventually come to a decision so he's saying here the city is also built in a in a in a way on the defense and celebration of speaking it, you know it's the idea that people through talking about things are gonna through talking about things together 
are going to figure out well what good policies are being, what, what, good, what could, good policies are. Uh, and so, you know, somebody might say, oh, we don't spend time talking. We just get down to it and act, right? People really do say that. Other people in Greece say that. And he's saying, no, the part of the Athenian idea is that talking, co collective sharing of thought through using words is integral to good action. And there's another important point for you. Um, yeah, and then so so that's that's a, that's his that's his discussion of what the city of Athens is and really what democracy means. And so he says um, on uh, 148, this is right before the beginning of uh, section 42. He says, uh, "This then is the kind of city for which these men." who could not bear the thought of losing her, nobly fought and nobly died. Um, so he's saying, you know, I've told you about the city, and, and so we're at this funeral celebrating slash mourning those who died in war, and he's saying this is why they died in war. They died fighting for this city. They died because they believed in this thing. Um, and he, and he says, so it is only natural that every one of us who survive them should also be willing to undergo hardships in her service, in service of this city. Uh, and he said, and it was for this reason that I have spoken at length about our city, because I want to make it clear that for us, there is more, there is more at stake here than there is for others in other cities. Like there's something special about this thing that we have, and we need to be prepared to fight for it. Um, And then, uh, last thing I want to say, for, well, I guess I still want to say two more things. So first of all, this on, on 149, I guess this is the last, thing for, the last thing from his speech, and then I want to talk about the context of the speech a bit. So in 149, section 43, he, he says then about the people who died, so and such they were, these men, worthy of their city. Right. So again, it's that idea that the reason these people are so important is because they died for this thing and that's 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 what they valued and that's why we should really honor and respect them and so then then he said then he makes this last point which fits with the thing i was just saying about being prepared to die for this this thing is so important you should fight for it he says at the uh, on this book at the bottom of 149 so this is two-thirds of the way into section 43 he says um It is, f so he says, it is for you to try to be like them. And I mean, you should take this as an injunction to yourself as well, not just, it's not just for ancient Athenians. He says, make up your mind, which is to say, recognize and become committed to this. Make up your minds that happiness depends on being free. And freedom depends on being courageous. Right, so happiness which is to say human i mean the, the feeling of being happy but just in general human flourishing the the uh, a good life for human beings depends on freedom and that's what democracy offers that nothing else does and it means the ability to regulate our own lives to be free in deciding how we're going to live and you need to recognize that that's that's the, that is something worth dying for right that our happiness depends on that but it's not just going to happen automatically. It only exists in the context where people are citizens, where we are courageous and are prepared to take a stand, indeed prepared to risk our lives to preserve this thing. And I think that might be one of the most important and, and stirring uh, messages from this speech. I mean, he had to make it there in the context of war. But one of the reasons for reading it in 2020 is because we're so used to living in this world that we can forget that it doesn't it didn't come out of a tree it didn't grow on a tree right democracy exists because people fought to bring it into being people have worked to bring it into being and they and they, they, they didn't bring it into being in a context where everybody else said yeah that's great let's make it happen it has to be brought into being in the context of other people who would rather it not happen you know as i was saying in the context of greek cities ancient greek cities the you know rich and wealthy and powerful people were pretty consistently putting their efforts in to squelch the democracy and and uh, turn those cities into oligarchical constitutions where only the smallest 
class of the hereditary nobility would be making the relevant decisions. And that's some version of that has been th true throughout history. And similarly, I mentioned that he, again in those uh, situations, it's not just the that kind of opposition, but there are also strong individuals like Pericles himself, powerful public figures who were eager to take advantage of their public popularity to have themselves elevated to a position where they could be tyrants, where they could seize power and, and take over and essentially rule as kings, you know, rather than being representative of a democratic city's interests. Um, so those issues, it seems to me, are as pressing in 2020 as they have ever been. Uh, and th this little speech is a, is a pretty powerful reminder of the fact that you're not going to be able to live in a democratic system just by sitting around and waiting it for it to roll out happily, that it's a thing that has to be fought for. Um, anyway, so that's Pericles on Athens. Now let me uh, slip, flip over to Xenophon, Xenophon on Sparta. Um, Xenophon, uh, I, th I think people figure this was written in about 390 BC. He's a little bit uh, younger, I think. Uh, and, uh, and um, but he's, so he's writing about Sparta. Uh, and um, let me just begin with the first sentence. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, reading it from, from this book, from uh, this collection, Aristotle and Xenophon on um, democracy and oligarchy, um, uh, which is a nice translation of a number of key works there. Um, he begins the, the Politeia, or the Constitution of the Spartans, by saying, I was reflecting one day on the fact that although Sparta has one of the smallest populations, it has become the most powerful and famous of all Greek states. And so, yeah, Sparta was famous, is powerful and it's famous. And it wasn't just famous for happening to be strong. Like, excuse me, it was also admired for, for like, that strength it was taken to demonstrate, excuse me, how great it was. And, uh, and so Xenophon himself says, I admire Lycurgus, the man who established the laws under which they flourished. I consider him a remarkably wise man. Um, and so, um, so, uh, so my point there, first of all, is just, you, it's important to remember that this, we're going to talk about a place now that's being celebrated. Um, and it's a place that's got pretty opposite institutions to the ones we just talked about in Athens. Um, and um, yeah, so he mentions Lycurgus, the lawgiver. Lycurgus is a, is a more, uh, it's not so obviously that he's a historical figure. He's a more slippery, than, uh, more slippery historical mythical figure. But he plays a role rather like Solon in Athens, whom I mentioned. So Solon is a historical figure, and he's the one, as I said, who was responsible in some significant way for developing the Athenian constitution that eventually became uh, um, the Athenian democracy. Oh, and in fact, uh, I won't mention it now. I'll come back to it. But I was going to say one other thing about Solon with respect to the funeral. So I'm going to try to remember to come back and say that, that last point I forgot to make. Um, but yeah, so, so comparable to Solon, the lawgiver who sort of set Athens on its path to democracy, Lycurgus is celebrated as the lawgiver of Sparta. So, and I guess the thing to emphasize there is, again, the notion of law, right? The, uh, even if this is a smaller group in power than in Athens, it's still a city that's run around, that runs around laws, the constitution. Um, and so, the, the, uh, you know, if, if you've read this, um, you know, as I said, you know, you should read this and think about how you feel about it. You know, the thing that's that is, I think, pretty striking is the intense regulation and control of family life and upbringing. Indeed, it's virtually the elimination of family life and its replacement with a military training camp. So, you know, he starts off by saying, uh, you know, from the start, girls are have to act this way. They have to engage in gymnastic training and so on. Why? Because you want them to give birth to strong babies. So like right off the bat, he says, this is a city that says, we're going to try to uh, get 
strong babies to be born so that we're going to have essentially strong soldier warrior types. Um, so that's already a pretty powerful value. And you might think, do I want to live in a place like that? I mean, maybe you do, but you should think about it. Um, and they're trying to do it by controlling birth, which you know, is what we would call eugenics, good, good birthing. Um, they're trying, they're, they're, the public policy is built around trying to shape how offspring are going to happen. Um, their methods are uh, considerably less sophisticated than, than could be possible in 2020, but within the limits of their knowledge, they're trying to make that happen. In this case, he says one of the things we do is, whereas other places, w one of the things the Spartan do, Spartans do is that whereas other places get the women to do sedentary things at home like uh, weaving, uh, uh, what the Spartans do is they get the women to exercise just like the men. Um, and and then he says um, also for the sake of get, having strong children uh, he says you know when when uh, this is another basic rule um, here more at the level of lifestyle and cultural values rather than a law and that's kind of like when when Pericles was saying here are the laws but here's also the kind of culture we have we we cultivate a sense of beauty we have a free and open life well this is again um, social per uh, the social perspective that is um, a collective value, but not ex not necessarily a rule. And he says the basic value is that <coughs> when when uh, when when a man marries a woman, he's not supposed to spend too much time with her, so that his desire for sex with her will be stronger because he won't be around her as much, uh, and that's going to make him more vigorous in sex and that's going to produce stronger children that's the idea again so again it's a version of this eugenics but again notice that how it comes it comes from values about or it comes it comes from practices that have to do with controlling the form intimate family life takes for the sake of the goals of the state's goals of political military power um and then, he, and then he goes on to talk about the, so that's, that's where children come from. They try to get through, through controlling how the women act and how the men behave towards the women. They want to try to get strong babies being born. That's state policy. And then he goes on to talk about education. And he says, um, you know, the children uh, have to wear bare feet so they get tough. Um, uh, they're, they're, they, they don't have private teachers. They have a, a general teacher who is really strict in punishing them. Um, and uh, they, you know, they try to control what kids are eating so that they uh, stay slim. They don't get, they don't get fat. Um, but they, but they also cultivate and encourage a practice of children going out and stealing the food they want. So they don't give them that much food. If they want good food, they got to go steal it. And they want them to learn how to steal because they want them to become sly and cunning and tough. And so it's both the case that they're encouraged to steal and it's the case that people are encouraged to punish them pretty severely if they get caught. It's not because stealing is bad, but because they want them to learn how to be tricky little fighters and, and sneaky little warriors. Um, um, and he also says, you know, they wear, they only wear one garment throughout the year. It's got, they got to wear it when it's hot. They got to wear it when it's cold, just because they got to get used to enduring the elements, right? So it's about toughening up these kids. And that's, that is the public thing. That's when they're younger, when uh, they get older, um, uh, they, these sorts of things in, in continue, right? They have to do more. Basically, military training is, is what education is, and when they become uh, when they become young men, they you know they, they they all eat eat their meals together in public messes, right? So the so the so f the Spartan family life has kind of been replaced with uh, boot camp, military training from childhood on. Um, and that pu the discussion of the public dinner is in section five. That's pages eighty to eighty-two of this one. And uh, he he remarks again in number six again more more on this idea of the uh, status of the family. He says in number six um, 
about authority. He says, uh, any man can punish any child, any child, any father can punish anybody's children. And if your child got published, punished by some other man, well, when he comes home, you should really punish him too. <laughs> so, um, so, so, uh, I guess then uh, we could talk about more, of course, but I want to emphasize two or three things about this. One, what kind of place is this? It's a place that's pretty stern and strict. Um, it's a place that's built around cultivating military prowess. And it does that by really virtually obliterating the family and replacing it with the state. So it's certainly true in Athens too that he said you should um, care about the state first. Uh, so in that respect, the, the, the orientation in Athens and the orientation in Sparta is not different. But, but how the state is construed is somewhat different. Um, and I mean, there would be many more things to say about Sparta too. I mean, because they're also dealing with a much more restricted view of who's going to count as a citizen, um, and that's who these policies are for. The other people are not not in very high regard. The the these are the citizens whose life is basically spent training to be the ones who are both going to be able to be great soldiers in war, and also who are going to have the power to be the strong group of citizens who can hold down all those other non-citizens who make up the city and who carry out you know the crafts the people who do more like the kind of peasant work uh, whereas the job of these citizens is going to be to hold power and perpetuate the power of of themselves um, so that's that's not really specified here, but these are really the rules for that relatively small group of citizens in this oligarchical city, uh, and that military prowess is going to let them beat other cities in war, but it's also going to let them hold their power against all the other social classes that they hold down. Um, so. Uh, so I'd like you to think about the contrast between those two visions of what a city should be. And let me add a couple of other things. You know, I, I said that, or I was, well, Pericles said that Athens really is cultured. It cultivates beauty, the arts, intellectual life, and so on. You don't get that from Sparta. There's very, very little of poetry and other things that you get out of Sparta. You get tons of it out of Athens. But that's not what they did here. I mean, they had some songs and dances, but it was not... A city that held it as a social or cultural or human value to cultivate beauty and they didn't cultivate intellectual work particularly either they cultivated military prowess that let them stay on top um, uh, one one last thing now I'm gonna just read a little bit of this uh, other constitution of the Athenians this um this is from I think people say somewhere around four 440 or 450 BC, um, so before the start of the Peloponnesian War, and nobody knows who it's written by, uh, but it's written by someone who uh, various things that he says, and it's got to be a he. These things in that culture, these things are all about men. In fact, I should go back and I'll add something about that about Athens in a minute. But um, he um, he may very well have been an Athenian citizen because he's at, at at least one point when he's talking about Athens he says we uh, but it, but it also seems like maybe he he he's very Spartan in his sympathies and it may be an Athenian who moved to Sparta uh, and he often refers to the Athenians as they but anyway he's gonna he describes um, he describes Athens and it's a very valuable historical document because his descriptions of how Athens works is is really rich but he doesn't like it and so that was the other thing I was saying like you know you you read Athens well most people when they read about Athens and Pericles think yeah that sounds like a good thing like yeah you know this is the familiar rhetoric of celebrating democracy and so on and you maybe have heard it too many times to feel moved by it at least at first but the point to remember is that you're this is a society where that was not the view and so the, this constitution of the Athenians is a guy describing the democracy quite well and his point is like what an awful place 
<laughs> you know, so he's saying, you know, we're, I'm going to tell you why the way they've chosen to run their city has allowed them to to develop a city that's that's strong and able to preserve itself. But man, is it ever a disgusting place? Why is it disgusting? Because the poor people get treated like they're human beings. Because poor people and slaves can walk around the street and 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 uh, not get beaten up, you know. And he thinks that's that's awful. He says this is a city that has no respect for honor in the sense that he really values. Um, so he says his opening line, uh, and this from this book is on page thirty-seven. He says, um, "Now in discussing the Athenian constitution." I cannot commend their present method of running the state because in choosing it, they preferred that the masses should do better than the respectable citizens. That's my reason for not commending it. Right? But then he says, since they have made this choice, I'm going to demonstrate how well they preserve their constitution and, and handle their own affairs because of it. So that in that opening thing, like he tells you the whole thing, like, I think this is a bad place. I think democracy is a bad idea. But here's why democracy at least works at allowing them to protect themselves. So anyway, I wanted to read that first thing just to remind you, just as Xenophon says, yeah, I, I admire Lycurgus. Like, this guy doesn't like Athens. And their view, uh, is a pretty prominent view among, well, that would be the view among the nobility. Right? Now, it might not have been the view among the peasantry. Uh, but that means that just about anything you're going to read from ancient Greece, which is going to come from members of an educated elite class and so on, almost always going to be written by people who have a sympathy against Athens, which I think is interestingly not true of um, Socrates, who, whom we're going to talk about in a little while. I mean, I don't know if that he's an, edu uh, that he's an elite member. It's, uh, people actually debate about that, and I'll talk about that later. But, um, but uh, generally, the the overall view of cultured people would be that, uh, I think, oligarchy is the superior thing, and uh, and so on. Um, okay, so um, I I want to just mention two, two. Th this is a great thing to read, and it tells you a lot about Athens and a lot about oligarchical sentiments too of the from the author. But I want to just identify two things he says. Uh, one is he says. On, uh, this is on 39, uh, it's per, or section number 13, he says about Athens, he says, The practice of physical exercises and the pursuit of culture has been brought into disrepute by the common people as being undesirable because they realize that these accomplishments are beyond them. However, for the staging of dramatic and choral festivals and the superintending of gymnasia and the games and the provision of triremes, they realize that it is the rich who pay uh, and the common people for whom these things are arranged and who serve in the triremes. Um, so this, that sentence is a little bit complicated, but the point is this. He says the Athens doesn't have f uh, a public concern with physical training like Sparta does. We've already seen that. And he says, at the same time, they got a lot of festivals. And he says, you know what, and those public people, they love their festivals and they let the rich people pay for them. Uh, but then he also mentions that the poor people work in the triremes, which is the boats. Um, and I'm going to say something about that. That's the other point I want to make. Just just one thing. On 39, he, he's, he's going to say two things about the Athenian navy. He says, um, I'm going to actually read a little bit of this. On 39, this is a, the section that begins, or begins at section 10. He says, slaves and metics. Metics means roughly resident aliens. It means people who are not from Athens, but who are now living there. They couldn't easily become citizens, couldn't, couldn't be citizens. Um, slaves and metics in Athen at Athens lead a singularly undisciplined life, which is one of the things this guy doesn't like about it. He says, one may not strike them there, nor will a slave step aside for you. Um, and he says, let me explain the reason for this. And th this uh, is his kind of grumpiness. He says, well, if it were legal for a free man to strike a slave or a medic, uh, or sorry, if it were legal for a free man to strike a slave, a medic or a freed man, sorry, I got to read that one. Uh, no, that's right. Uh, then, then an Athenian would often have been struck under the mistaken impression that he was a slave. For the clothing of the common people there is in no way superior to that of the slaves and medics, nor is their appearance. So one of the things he's saying is like, 
us, the citizens, are no better than slaves. Like they don't dress nicely and so on, right? So if they if, you, if they let you hit slaves, well then you could hit you could hit citizens, and that would you know they wouldn't go for that. Um, whether or not that's the reason for it, um, it describes well both this man's attitude, but it also tells you something about the character of the social or cultural life in Athens. Um, but then he, he goes on a little bit farther. He says, there is also good sense behind the apparently surprising fact that they allow slaves there to live in luxury, and some of them in, mag in considerable magnificence. Because he says, in a state relying on naval power, it is inevitable that slaves must work for hire so that they may take profits from what they earn, and they must be allowed to go free. Um, uh, uh, um. No, I thought he was going to say something uh, later. Well, yeah, basically he's going to say they need these people to work in their fleet. Um, and then and then he says at one other spot, he uh, on 41, this is around section 19, he says, because at the Athenians own property abroad and public duties take them abroad, they're always sailing around. And he says, everybody learns to row from an early age. Anyway, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I found exactly the passage I was after, but I, what I found is close enough. So one of the, the distinctive things about Athens, and I think I mentioned this before, was that it had a very powerful navy, and unlike Sparta. And that partially was because um, people did... The, worked as you know rowers in the in the big warships and so on and that was that was how they would carry out their military service and so you need a lot of people to do that um, and so he's saying that one of the things about the democracy is that it allowed for a, a, a city that could develop a powerful navy unlike a city like Sparta where the citizens who were going to be the soldiers were relatively few, and they spent, you know, they had the money to buy uh, good weapons and armor and so on. And they were they were, were a powerful land infantry. Um, he, he's saying that the the there's there's an intimate connection then between the Athenian navy and Athens' military power that came from that, and the fact of this broader based. Uh, inclusion of people who were going to be able to fight for the city uh, and using them as uh, rowers in this in the sailing and so on anyway I just wanted to, to mention those two those two things the the um, the thing about the Navy and then before that the thing about the um, his, his characterization of that issue of physical exercise physical training and arts and culture the contrast between them and Sparta and Athens. Um, so there is there is a quick picture of Sparta and Athens from those um, two writers, and I'd like you to think about that. And the last thing I just want to say before wrapping this up is the thing I forgot to say about the funeral oration. It's noteworthy that the, that Pericles is speaking at a civic funeral for the war dead. Right, the city is the one who's recognizing those war dead, not the individual family members. Um, you, think about that in your own right but I just want to take that back for a second that was also one of Solon's reforms back in 580 or whatever it was um, he put all kinds of limits on the power of families to have huge funeral celebrations to um, mourn the dead because those families were the families uh, you know of the of the nobility those those families would bring out tons and tons and tons of people to mourn the death of a son and they'd have they'd pay people to mourn and they'd have you know big celebrations where women would claw their face and bleed and sing certain songs and so on and the point is those funeral activities are partially about mourning a dead person but they're also a demonstrations of family power and family solidarity so part of the the way Solon's reforms were moving in the direction of democracy was limiting the power of independent families to use funerals to um, you know sort of rhetorically advocate for the for family importance as opposed to the city and so Pericles giving the city's funeral speech here and that whole policy of the city being the one that's gonna carry out the funeral of the dead rather than of the war dead rather than the family is it again an, an important thing to look at for this idea that 
uh, city allegiance is in a way going to trump family authority. Um, so that that last reflection is kind of out of place. I meant to give that back when we were talking about Pericles, but it, it just sort of completes the picture. Anyway, there's a little sketch of these two cities. And I'd like you to think about their different um, characteristics and, uh, and also to think about uh, your own views about them. Those are the cities that were fighting in that war, and Athens lost. Um, that's, those things are all important to think about in their own right, but they're, I think, especially helpful to think about and important to think about now as we go on to read Plato.